Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Oz Seabed Quarterly Showcase for July. It's my pleasure to be introducing the showcase for the first time, representing the team here at Geoscience Australia. So if you don't know me, uh, my name is Scott Nicholl. I'm the Director of National Seabed Mapping, and it's uh, a real pleasure to be taking over the Oz Seabed Management while Kim Picard takes a well-earned break. She's over in North America currently having a, having a great time. Um, but before we commence, uh, of course, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we all meet today. I'm speaking to you from Nungawal country here in Canberra and pay my respects to elders past and present. We have a really exciting and, and packed busy showcase uh, this morning um, with a range of presentations. Uh, and to lead us through the agenda this morning, I'll now hand over to Natalie Leonard from GA. Over to you, Natalie. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Scott. Now let's see if my screen, there we go. Um, so we're going to give a quick overview of the past quarter. So we work in quarterly planning, so we'll give you a look at that. We've been doing a piece of work in partnership with the Australian Research Data Commons, which is our GMRT, the Global Multi-Resolution Topography Prototype. We've got some work happening around data submission and easing the pathway for you guys to provide data through to us. We've got some overviews on the data set publication, an update from the HIP panel, um, a really great presentation from UWA on seismic bathymetry, and then some views on what's next and time, hopefully time for some Q&A at the end. So without further ado, a quick update on the increment. So, what you're seeing in here is sort of a very high level plan for the increment. What we were looking at doing were those items that weren't ticked off uh, for the next quarter. The two that are uh, crossed in red were postponed to the 22-23 um, later in the year. So they're still sort of sitting where they need to sit. If we have a look at what we've actually achieved, um, we've got a draft of the 2030 uh, plan and revised strategy and roadmap that's going through to the steering next to the steering committee for the next session. Uh, we have seismic derived bathymetry data sets, which we're showcasing to you today. And um, we've got executive board organization data sets coming online in the form of the of the first data set from the Nyinya from the Australian Antarctic Division. And we're in the process of onboarding data from the HIP. So going quite well, the integrated data delivery pipeline architecture is underway. It's a big job. So it's ongoing, but we do hope to have that happening uh, and included in the papers that will go to the steering committee for the next meeting. So all looking good. We're tracking quite nicely, particularly considering all of the uh, COVID outbreaks as they're escalating coming into winter. But um, yeah, it's going along quite nicely. So I will now, I'll keep driving the slides, but I'll hand over to Josh, I'm assuming, to talk about the global multi-resolution topography prototype. Thanks, Nat. I will share my screen because we'll do a live demo. Um, firstly, uh, so to date, DMRT OC bed project has been uh, a group of people all working collaboratively together. It's it's been a great success. Uh, ARDC, who are the uh, funders of this project. We've had expert advice from a whole bunch of different departments. Um, big thanks to Lamont Doherty, Earth Observatory, who uh, do GMRT itself, provided a great amount of information on how this data is collated, reviewed. Uh, we had CSIRO, Deakin University, James Cook, all provided us with um, all the data that we had for this project. And uh, a small thank out to Carl DB, who actually provided, while not a member on the project itself, uh, did come on board to help us out with uh, a lot of the technical infrastructure and answering a lot of our development questions that I personally had uh, when we were building this thing. So what we have to date uh, is a prototype application. This is a, a small screenshot um, of the data we have available in, in the catalog. So we'll go have a look at this now. And here we, we can get a bit of an overview of what the catalog presents to date. We do have some filtering. Uh, we can draw an area of interest 
Uh, but at the moment, as far as any filters on the data sets themselves, we're only providing start and end dates. Um, but we can preview some quickly preview or zoom to where data sets are located. Um, and as I go through, I think we provide we'll provide with about 23 data sets itself. Um, and the one we'll have a quick look at now and do a compilation. Uh, is this one called uh, Bunarong? And we're going to run through in doing a gridding from. Someone needs to mute. I'll just continue. Thank you. Um, so we'll do some gridding on the fly. So we have produced uh, data at, uh, we've just pulled all the points uh, available uh, within the data itself, which is all the individual beams. Uh, so and we're going to use this uh, cube algorithm and we're going to grid at two meters. So I'm going to draw an area covering roughly what the survey is and let it go. So we get a small progress bar and this will tick away in the background for roughly five minutes. Hopefully I'll finish the presentation before it finishes and I'll continue on from where I left off. So the data sets that we are producing, we're using TileDB as the main storage backend uh, to, to house, it. in this instance, we're just doing um, all of the attributes that we found available within this generic sensor format. So it's not just X and Y uh, and Z. We're also exposing uh, the horizontal and vertical accuracies, the speed, um, any any of the information that was gathered at the time that a um, survey was undertaken. Uh, we produce an overall coverage map of where the, the data is actually located. And we're using Stack, the spatio temporal asset catalog, as the specification for our geospatial data and our metadata. So it's all uh, merged into one, as well as uh, density. We're producing a density layer to give people an idea of what the density of the data set is uh, before they even grid. So you can get an overview of, uh, well, essentially density of a beam count within a defined uh, area. Uh, most of the data or well, all the data has been produced uh, using longitudinal and latitudinal dimensional axes. So you can query for data using standard longitude latitude. Uh, working with GMRT, um, they're Internally, they do a lot of filtering at a, at a ping level, uh, for instance, for a given ping, look at the slope between beams. And if it's over a given threshold, uh, eliminate the point. So part of their gridding process also removes data. And it's much easier to do these specific beam filtering um, where, where it's specific to the sensor itself uh, on a different dimensional axis. So we're also producing data uh, where data is accessed by a ping and beam number. So we can access in this example here, 100 to 500 pings for all beams. And on the right, we can access a general spatial blob. They both have their positives, benefits, um, using long longitudinal, latitudinal axes. You can ex expose it to generic tools like PDAL, where there's a whole bunch of other spatial filtering and gridding algorithms available. Now I mentioned beam sounding or density. So this is an example of a data set that was, uh, we've just pulled together a grouping of beam counts based using an RHEL PIX DGS to define a gridding structure. So uh, this particular, for instance, is referring to two meter gridding. Um, cells are defined, I can point people to RHEL PIX if they're interested, uh, but it, it's a predefined hierarchical cell structure, nested cell structure um, for the entire globe as an equal area projection. But uh, and every cell has a unique identifier. Um, here we do a grouping based on that unique identifier to give us density. 
But not only that, you, we can act because we're exposing a whole bunch of other attributes, you can do the same thing for horizontal or vertical error. We've also found it was useful to generate the actual data set geometry. Now, the data set geometry is can be quite difficult to do when just dealing at the point level. Um, a convex hull works all right. However, when you have natural disparity between data and um, segregation, it breaks down because it treats that hole in the middle as uh, as a full envelope of contained points. Whereas here we're only trying to present the geometry of where data actually exists. And I'll click there and hopefully, oh, there we go. Oh, I didn't get a download screen or it's still building. So I think it's about five minutes, but yeah, within five minutes, we can get a grid uh, using, in this instance, we've done it using this cube algorithm that we've that has been made available publicly by UK Hydro. Um, but we also have um, ones exposed by PDAL, just a very generic gridding algorithm that PDAL has. And we're prototyping a Haxby gridding, which what GMRT do. And yeah, it's still exporting, but anyway, it's, I think it's compiling metadata. So when you download a data set, we'll get it to, to create a grid. Metadata is also generated using the stack specification and embedded within the metadata is information such as uh, what gridding methodology, what was the bounds of interest used, what filtering was applied to the data prior to gridding. So conceptually, this is this metadata document can be passed to someone else to and used to replicate the exact same behavior. So now we can have a replicable uh, service. And the way for me, that's a science underpinning to have a repeatable methodology. So um, anyway, that's it from me. And yeah, any questions? Thanks, Josh. Yeah, any questions for Josh? And we can kind of leave this up here for a few more seconds to see if it actually <laughs> it, it actually up. just popped up then. <laughs> oh, there you go. It's the nature of the beast. Whenever you do a live demonstration, it always, always takes that one second longer. So Josh, do you want to show again? Yeah, there we go. Just download here so I can have a look at the metadata itself. Uh, here's a stack document. As I mentioned, uh, we're storing uh, information about what actually occurred. So the provenance information, uh, the tools that we use to do this, we're storing the versions. So if we need to deploy the app again, we know what was used to produce a product itself. Uh, the data set will have a unique identifier. Uh, when it was created. So it invaluable provenance information. So the worst thing that can really happen is this was produced and you have no idea how it was produced and when it was produced, but you want to give it to someone. And there it, it sort of throws into a bit of questionability about what is the usability of this data. Um, and the grid itself is hopefully looks sane enough. There we go. I can put a different stretch on and oops, there's something like that and bang. But yeah, there we go. It's uh, we've done a very basic evaluation with what we can get out of, uh, I believe it, what's it called? Not Chimera, there's another Karis piece Karis. of software. Yep. Karis, and uh, where 95% of the data is within 50 centimeter tolerance in a vertical difference. So it's, um, I don't know what is termed as acceptable, but from a numerical standpoint, that's pretty good. When we're at 99% um, difference, we're still within a meter tolerance. Um, so as far as the comparison between the two, it's pretty spot on. Awesome, thanks Josh. It. Uh, I've got a question here from Rowan. How big was the source point cloud data for that uh, being wrong survey? I think it might've been around a billion points, but I'm not sure. Um, it was a fairly large survey in, in terms of density, um, small spatial area, but high in density. 
in cold, I think when it's shallower areas, it tend to get higher dense points. I'm not a marine baddie expert by any sense, um, learning it for myself. But um, yeah, it was considered, or I was told it was, it, it's a pretty big data set. Awesome, thanks. So I'm not seeing any other hands raised at the moment. So we'll push on. I'll just go back to sharing and Neil. I, oh, sorry, we had a hand come up just at the last minute there from Z. Thanks, Joshua. Uh, I think it's really good to look to look to, to look at this and uh, the GMRT too. My question is whether or not this greeting process actually implements some sort of interpolation if there's data gap in the you know in the area uh, you want to grid. So as far as that cube gridding algorithm, I have no idea what it does internally. I've not read through the code personally. Um, no doubt there's some form of interpolation process that goes on between neighboring uh, pixels. Um, there's other algorithms. So the PDAR one that we exposed does do some interpolation. Uh, we can also, there is a tick box that I didn't select in that example that you we can in fill it in with the Jebco grid as well. Um, but I guess in a generic sense, any kind of interpolation algorithm should work. Um, but yeah, we haven't explored any further smoothing, which um, some tools may do. But um, yeah, as a first cut, it seems to balance out pretty well with what we're getting from Karis. That's great. Good enough. Thank you. Awesome. I was just going to add that uh, the UKHO um, Cube open source plugin is sort of the back to base source as well. So we can provide a link to that repo so you can have a look into that too. Over to you, Neil. Oh, sorry, B, all these people popping up from GA. Yep, we have a, a few questions in the chat uh, for Josh. Right. Thank you. So firstly from Rowan. I think we covered uh, Rowan first, yep. Okay, good, we've got Marty. Yep. Um, if the underlying survey data has some le has had some level of processing already applied, is this documented in the metadata? For example, uh, for a shallow coastal area of interest, would the end user know if tide files had been applied? So we do try and expose as much metadata as possible. The what, whatever we were provided with and whatever we could harvest as far as the processing, what someone did in processing, and that is uh, available in those in the stack metadata geojson documents. So um as for standards of where it would be and how it would be we're still trying to work that through it was a very difficult one to manage um but in general i have seen information there that would say whether it was even tide corrected or something like that um but yeah it would be in a sh shorter answer um, um, I think there's another one yeah go ahead josh uh from rob have you tried integrating overlapping surveys to make a grid. Yes, <laughs> actually the uh, demo I did earlier in the week, um, uh, it involved, yeah, two different surveys. Uh, actually, this one wasn't overlapping. I have done another one that was overlapping, um, not in a live demo, didn't have an issue, um, but how the methodology of we pull overlapping things together, uh, not sure what happens behind the scenes at this point. I think it's another thing we'd like to work through as far as how how do you determine determine something to have a greater preference to go over the top. Like GMRT, for instance, use a, a weighting methodology for for beams, but it does it. It just may not have the order of preference that someone would desire. That answers it. And Rob, I think that. Um, we will probably be in touch as we move forward with the next year's work plan because that's one of the items that um, that will be coming up, that weighting or that preferential ordering. Okay, have we got everybody covered now? No more questions? We can always come back at the end as well. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, Neil. All right, thank you. Um... So just want to acknowledge um, the great work of the whole team, really, uh, but the, the key drivers in, in these sort of uh, data submission, data register uh, 
activity has certainly been Natalie, uh, myself and Jaleel. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please, I'll start off. So um, basically, the data submission service is the first thing I want to talk about. And it's effectively a tool to support contributing data providers um, to basically upload their data directly to the seabed, uh, the OzSeabed Data Hub. Um, and it is a component of the overall data register for which I'll talk about later. Uh, consequently, that's why you can sort of see a sort of a you know, somewhat complex uh, architectural diagram there. Um, the red box and, the, and the, the, the data register itself, I'll speak about later. It's the green box that I'm mentioning here at the moment. And the good news is it's got a big tick, it's done. Um, we designed this to basically streamline data upload and reduce all the effort and the cost and the time delays of posting and returning hard drives and moving things between different um, environments. So it's been a, a great test. We've, we've tested, we've received our first data set via this service, so it's working. Um, and so tick of approval, it's out there. So if we move to the next slide, please, I sort of want to take us through uh, the overall process of data submission, and then I'll give you a quick demonstration of the specific data submission tool service itself. But the overall um, process is this. One, there's a self-assessment process. And this is where we want our contributing data partners to have a bit of look, go through and do a self-assessment. You know, can I share the OZ bed? Have I got the right area? Have I got the right data? Um, is it the priorities of the OZ bed community at the moment? Um, and the second item there on there is the, oops, sorry, go back one more. Sorry, thanks, Nat. Um, I'll say next <laughs> um, is the is just re-highlight another thing that we've delivered in the last quarter, which is the Aussie bed uh, product specifications. Looking at the the specifications for the metadata, the raw uh, multi-beam, the process multi-beam, and the gridded multi-beam. So using these things, um, our contributing partners can certainly do a self-assessment, determine whether they're ready to to contribute. So next, please. Uh, then what we've done is we've built a series, uh, and that's what you're seeing flying up at the moment, a series of uh, help guides, page, uh, pages, websites, uh, templates, forms, you name it. And this is the second step in the overall process is a notice of intent. If you've done your self-assessment, we've got a form uh, which you can download as, a, as an email, as a Word document and send us an email, but basically just sort of registers your intent and gives us a bit of information about um, the, the volume of data, who you are, the organization, the various things. It's really useful for the next step, so we'll go next. Um, well, actually a further step, but there's a self-registration. So this news, this is where I'm specifically talking about the data submission tool itself. Self-registering, you can go online, register your own account, you fill in some basic key details, um, and there'll be a process that will follow and I'll take you through that in the next slide. But we'll just go next. Um, once you've submitted that uh, self-registration, you'll receive a, a, an automatic reply saying, thank you for registering with Oz Seabed. And basically to wait for an email um, to let you come in and, and log back in. Uh, the reason that is we want to sort of uh, assess those requests and not just sort of get a whole bunch of, a bunch of spam, for example, or anything else. So basically what happens is it'll send an email to um, the data management capability and we'll do an assessment. We'll use the original notice of intent, intent to register as a comparison. Um, and if need be, we can validate uh, email addresses and contact details and authority. Uh, so next, um, once you've gone through the process, uh, you'll receive uh, a set of credentials that will let you log into a specific um, personalized S3 bucket. Uh, we'll give you a whole set of links um, and help and guides at each step of the way. Um, but yeah, basically you'll, you'll receive your credentials, which you can then use to uh, use any piece of software that you're comfortable with or you have already, or you may want to download others um, to connect to an S3 bucket and upload your data. Uh, next, and of course, so that we don't forget the whole process, we've given, we've got an online data service guide. So all the way along the step of this process, and we'll hit next, thanks Nat. Um, that whole concept fully supported by documentation and online um, forms is our sort of overall data submission service. If we go to next, I'll just very, very quickly take you through the specifics. You'll see a couple of similar slides 
because I've repeated them, but this is the actual registration process for the tool. So we hit next. Basically, you saw that earlier. Fill in your form. Basically, you'll receive uh, an automatic um, thank you. That will then generate a um, email to the data management capability where they will do an assessment of that request. And on confirming that request, you'll then receive an email back saying, congratulations, you can now log back into the data submission service. And we want you to do that. Oh, sorry, one back. Sorry, Nat. Um, we want you to do that because the actual logging in, the first time you create the account, the second time you're logging in, that logging in process is really important because what it does is it, it again, initiates a whole series of automation processes, uh, one being the creation of your bucket, uh, two, creating all of the security and the credentials, sending you an email with those credentials um, and following the process. So I think after you receive that email, you log back in, yep, with the, the sort of the form you see very similar, just then it's your first name. Here's that uh, email that you receive, which tells you the specific bucket name, your access and secret key, which gives you personalized, secure environment to work in. Um, from that point on, you've got everything you need to upload. Um, you can use a number of tools I've already used um, to do connections, the AWS CLI command line interface. I use Cloudbree, um, which is about a $60, uh, a, a $60 license, US dollar license. Uh, I've also used um, Beyond Compare and also tested a S3 bucket, which is a little piece of software that at the moment, it's, it's, it's oldish, but it allows you to install it without uh, it doesn't require installation. It can be run from a, a, a hard drive or a USB device. Um, and in some cases, like GA, you can't install software without admin rights. So sometimes this software is just a nice little filler until you can go through the formal processes. So next, um, okay, so that's the, the data submission service. I'll do three next if I can, that I think, is the what, the why, and the overall. So. What I showed you before was to the left of this red box, and that's the data submission service, which is a component of <clears throat> our data register. Now, there are other components you can see outside of the box, and we'll, be, we'll look at those in future um, phases of the work. But the, the, uh, the phase of work that we're looking at here at the moment is specifically around the data register, the ability to upload metadata, to um, monitor the progress of the acquisition through to the clearinghouse, through to the processing, pipeline through to the publication process and a whole search routine. So this data register effectively is our, our central facet of our data hub back office. Um, it's a register or a catalog, call it what you like, and provide a whole variety of services to internal and external users um, from data submission through to data availability. And obviously it's to improve our overall data management um, from, from that life cycle but ultimately to so that it improves our searchability, our reporting capabilities, our auditing. Um, it'll give us a very uh, repeatable service and a very well managed service. So where are we up to? We'll hit next. What we've got here is, oh, sorry, another one. So we've done all the requirements and the logical design, and I think I reported on that at the last uh, quarterly showcase. Um, we completed the internal consultation and environmental scan. And we submitted a pitch to our internal ICT um, area, which they reviewed, assessed, accepted, and have planned resources, which is great news for us because we've got effectively a funded set of resources now to commence development, which we believe is going to happen next month. All right, next. Uh, so the timeline where we've come from is obviously that last quarter, the, the, the May to June, and I've just summarized everything we've got done to that point. We're currently in this July period, which is sort of an initiation phase. We're just sort of tweaking and scoping the specifics of what we need from this development team. Uh, in August, we'll move into the, the sort of first phase of a development phase um, with the intent of releasing a minimum viable product by the end of the calendar year. Um, that minimum viable product will then be enhanced over time in, in the outer um, PIs. Uh, project increments where we um, we do our work and we'll continue to enhance that based on client support and feedback and, and how everything goes. So I think we'll hit next and see where I'm up to. Right, take home messages for everybody, just in summary. 
self-registration data submission service ready to go. Product specs, they're ready to go, they're ready to be used, but they're still being reviewed to, um, through testing. And we're doing that by um, working with AHO, with AIMS, with UWA, and anyone else who wants to participate. But at, that, at this stage, that's where we're going at the moment. Um, and they're actually submitting data and using the product specs to help them decide and you know whether, how well they can match those specs and whether we need to review them any further. If you're ready to submit data, please contact us and we'll help you go through the self-assessment. We'll help you do, use the submission tool. We're here to help. In terms of data register, we're in the implementation plan. Um, it's all about improving our data management. It's going to include a metadata upload service. Um, and the development we're looking at beginning in an August with a minimum viable product by the end of the calendar year. So the next slide is just a series of um, links, which I'm just going to quickly get up and give you a, a, a simple one in the chat for anybody who wants. Control C. I'm going to put in the chat effectively a link that will let anybody go to all of those um, pages that we I showed before. Uh, the incoming data policies and procedures, the guidelines, the self-assessment process, um, the contributing partner request form, anything you see on that table there is now available through that one link. Um, feel free to have a read. And I'll leave it there and open up for any questions. Awesome. Thanks, Neil. Uh, so we have a question from Rob. So it says, focus looks like multi-beam only, but can data submission also include single beam data, such as from crowdsourced bathymetry? I, I think I can answer that and say, yes, uh, at the moment we are focused on bathymetry, but we are mindful that the data hub's long-term scope is not just for multi-beam. So we are ready to work through the process of accepting other data types and we're aware that that's going to happen so yeah. more than happy to yeah it's not a don't walk away come and chat to us and we'll see what we can do and and, and as you'll see later on the, we have had a submission for some seismic derived bathymetry so we've got that data being delivered through the uh, sub data submission service so yeah we'll certainly look and discuss it with everybody yeah thank you Fantastic. Any other questions? No hands up that I'm missing. Cool. Let's move on. Moving on. Okay, we have Mikhail for a multi beam data set overview. Uh, thanks, Nat. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, oh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah. Sorry, we've just got somebody who's not on mute in the background. Oh, yeah. As well. I don't know if it's in, in office or otherwise. That's gone uh, down. <laughs> yeah. I don't think awesome. it was no, no, that's cool. Thank you. Uh, yes. So I'm representing the processing team at our seabed, uh, the noise suppressors. Uh, so I joined in uh, this year uh, to help with the output uh, for published data sets. Um, so that consists of uh, USD, of course, uh, Michaeli, Chris, and myself. Um, since July uh, 2021, last year, um, we've output a number of data sets, so Capital Bay, uh, Recherche Archipelago, uh, the Rain Island data set, Arufara Marine Park, uh, Coral Sea Canyons, uh, Visioning the Coral Sea, so that the, the Falcor data sets, um, uh, Cape Range, uh, Tasmanted Seamounts, Shell Harbour, uh, Carpentaria Reefs, a couple of uh, Wilson's Prom surveys that I worked on, and um, Vernon Islands, Banks Strait. There's also uh, the HMAS Canberra uh, shipwreck data set and uh, Bunurong missing from that list, but um, yeah, so uh, that's what we've got at the moment. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and, and these are available, of course, through the Seabed portal. So just putting a plug in um, to encourage uh, accessing that and um, uh, utilizing that. And there's uh, some examples of the, of the data sets that um, had been published in uh, the last 12 months. Um, next slide. So at the moment, uh, yeah, we've got a number of surveys that we are processing. Um, a major preoccupation of mine has been the Antarctic uh, voyage, the RSV, newly commissioned RSV Nuinia uh, bathymetry data set. Um, so pro producing a more detailed report uh, on the processing methodology there. And uh, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, that uh, had made headlines uh, recently with the discovery of a large canyon system uh, beneath, extending from the Vanderford Glacier. Um, so yeah, it's been uh, uh, 
particularly valuable data set and uh, definitely helps uh, integrate and improve our uh, processing uh, pipeline. Um, next slide. Uh, so yeah, this uh, diagram just basically takes through the uh, processing uh, method. So we'll get data ingestion, in this case from AAD. Um, a portion of the data was actually processed uh, shipboard um, uh, uh, on the Noinia and to an L2 standard using Chimera. Uh, so uh, I did a bit of uh, data gymnastics to uh, incorporate that with the Keras uh, processing version. But um, so we uh, received that data from AAD and uh, then there's also a unique component of manual processing, um, which was done. Uh, and also implementation of our uh, Quacks QAQC procedure, uh, which I'll go into a little bit more detail uh, in a later slide. Um, but uh, ultimately, yeah, we uh, process that uh, to an L3 standard for uh, publication into the OSCBED uh, portal. And uh, the figure here just shows uh, a five meter grid that I rendered um, uh, next to previously uh, Acquired data. So uh, a few years back, um, the, uh, a data set offshore KC was collected, and this is a one meter resolution and uh, just shows the nice continuity between um, the, the, the two data sets, which is really nice to see. Um, and oh, next slide, please. I've got a. Uh, yeah, so here, uh, uh, this has this been gridded to one meter, and the, the new data on the left um, is colored. Uh, so that's from the Nuna, and you can see that it, it extends really nicely with the hill shade uh, from the previous data set there. Um, of course, we can't get that quality everywhere, but uh, this is a good example of some of the shallow water areas um, and, and demonstrates the quality. So on the right, you can see the, uh, you can barely see a suture <laughs> between it. Um, uh, next slide. Um, so the data uh, for this particular survey was separated into shallow water sections, so Hobart, Casey, and Davis, um, and they were gridded 64 meters uh, in accordance with uh, the OSCEBA depth uh, recommendation. And the transit data, which is pretty standard, is just uh, 128 meters. Uh, next slide. Uh, the quacks component. So, uh, for example, the NOAA received uh, reports in 2015 that uh, about 25% of data that was ingested had been affected by flyers, so acoustic anomalies that we very much don't like in our data. Um, there's yeah, various methods to deal with these. Um, Quacks uses an automated scan method, so a threshold value uh, to weed out uh, the, those anomalies. And um, on the left, we can see in Keras uh, what the output of that is. Um, so we've got points that locate uh, where, where flyers have been detected using the threshold values that we've calibrated. And that increases efficiency, just allows the operator to uh, hone in on those areas and um, uh, assess uh, uh, and eliminate if necessary. Um, so that's an iterative process. Uh, yeah, uh, next slide, please. And um, yeah, here's, here's an example, probably the nicest part of the data set. Uh, at 64 meters, so that's the product that's uh, will, <coughs> excuse me, that will be available for uh, uh, AAD, um, and that uh, you can see the canyon system that was in those headlines, uh, extending northward away from the Vanderford Glacier. There, uh, uh, next slide. So take-home messages uh, and next steps. Uh, we want to continue, to, of course, to publish data sets in accordance with uh, OSCEVA procedures. Um, we're integrating the Quacks QAQC standard operating procedure, and that's uh, being reviewed uh, and amended as well. Uh, uh, also, develop um, continues to develop the multi beam data processing standard operating procedure, and um, continue to assess and implement updates to the processing pipeline. So we're always looking at increasing efficiency um, for our output and ensuring that we maximise data quality <laughs> as well. Um, yeah, uh, that's uh, me. I think. Awesome. Thanks, Mikhail. Um, were there any questions? And apologies, my finger just hit the right click button on my mouse as I was scrolling <laughs> for the pop up in the middle of the presentation. 
No questions? Okay, rolling right along. I will hand over to Nigel from the AHO. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, just confirming you can hear me. Yep, good. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to give a, a quick update on the HIP activities um, um, and, and surveys conducted. Um, so um, we're currently undertaking Hydro Scheme 2021, which is for the financial year 21 to 22. Um, so those surveys that were, were published uh, and are shown on the map there, we've now completed all the, the field work activities for those. So I can take you through and show you uh, what was achieved in each of those areas. Um, we, we achieved all those except for one survey that was not awarded um, for, for various reasons. Um, so quite a successful and very busy year for, for the HIP and the, the contractors. So the next slide, Natalie. The first one we did was a combined uh, multi-beam and, and LiDAR survey of uh, the Lapsea Channel, which is just north of Broome, uh, covering the inshore uh, transit route up into the Kimberleys. Um, and we collected uh, uh, full coverage data, mostly with LiDAR, but with multi-beam on, on the main shipping route. Um, and uh, a very uh, successful survey conducted by Fugo. Um, and that was the field work was conducted uh, last year and the data has now been accepted and is going through into the, the charting process. We just go to the next one, Nelly. We did a couple of projects up in uh, the Beagle Gulf off Darwin. Um, 1016 is the, the, the main one in the centre of that image there, which is conducted by Guardian Geomatics. Uh, again, a very successful multi beam survey. Um, with a lot of high quality uh, data collected. A few gaps in the coverage due to uh, uh, fish farms where we couldn't get boats into, uh, but we've managed to get good coverage up through the uh, through the islands. Um, and the next one, please, don't leave. And, and bordering that one was actually 1003, the, the title's incorrect there. But uh, again, a Guardian survey, uh, just moving uh, the inshore route, which uh, vessels are following along Melville Island. And we've got very good coverage, again, covering that area. And the next one, please, Natalie. We also did a survey in Cameron Sound, um, which is uh, in, in the, the Kimberleys. Uh, and this was a, uh, a uh, MMA survey. Um, very complex survey in a very challenging area with, with currents and, and tidal streams. Uh, but again, we managed to get uh, full coverage in the areas that we wanted, and we now have full coverage of that area. Um, next one, please. Uh, Prince of Wales Channel, we did a, a continuous survey through the Prince of Wales Channel, which is the main shipping route in through Torres Strait. Um, and this survey was conducted by EGS. Um, and achieves uh, a very good uh, result in very shallow, challenging waters. Um, up to 13 tie gauges deployed for this one, as well as current meters. And the next one, please, Natalie. We also uh, extended the coverage up in Great North East Channel, uh, again, following the two-way route, uh, doing a full coverage of the area. And again, this is an EGS survey that followed on from the Prince of Wales Channel survey. Um, and again, very successful, and that data is coming into the office now. And the next one, please, Natalie. And we then did a series of surveys uh, extending the coverage we achieved in Bank Strait. So we, we extended um, out into the ocean and, and sort of up the uh, east coast of the Ferno Group. Um, so uh, this survey was conducted by, at the time, IX Blue, but they're now Ocean Infinity. Um, and again, uh, very good coverage and overlapping with the uh, Continental Shelf surveys by SIRO. And the next one, Natalie. And bordering that was a uh, survey done by MMA Offshore, um, again off the, the east coast of, of Flinders Island, um, getting very good coverage. These surveys were getting down into 300 metres or thereabouts, but we, we overlapped the uh, SORO work, so we weren't chasing the continental slope. And the next one, please, Natalie. Um, and we did Flinders Island northeast, which just sort of carried on from that last survey. And this one was done by Guardian Geomatics. So we had three HIP contractors working simultaneously in the area to uh, maximise the coverage as quickly as we could. And that worked out very well. Uh, next slide, Natalie. Um, so Hydro Scheme 2022, which is the plan for the next financial year, that is commencing now. Um, so all those projects are in contract with the, the companies listed next to the project. So you can see where the activities are going to be. And again, one project was not awarded due to uh, um, the 
financial reasons. Um, but uh, currently we have operations north of Darwin with uh, PHS undertaking a survey mobilising this week. And Fugo is undertaking a survey down on the Ferno Group with uh, LIDAR, which has been underway for about a month now. And if we just go to the next slide, there's a, a sort of screenshot of their progress so far. That's about three quarters of the way through the project, showing um, um, some uh, targeting uh, 0 to 20 metres. And uh, we're getting some, uh, so far, some, some good results, uh, but still work to be done there. Uh, but as a project that's underway. And the next one, please don't leave. Just about highlight um, Hydro Skiing 2020. Uh, all those projects are now fully completed, processed, and accepted by the AHO, um, and has been a, approved to release the data to Ossibet at a gridded 30 meter resolution. And we're, we're doing that uh, in the next uh, uh, month or two, hopefully. And I think that's all we have for HIP at the moment. If there's any questions. Awesome. So any questions for Nigel? It's very exciting to be getting the HIP data coming through soon. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. So moving along, we've got Ulysses from UWA um, presenting on our seismic derived bathymetry data set. Hi, good morning. Um, well, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to talk. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. So we've been working quite a lot over the last few years to try to think how we could like improve the multi beam coverage around Australia. And it is like quite a challenge simply because it is very expensive and time consuming to go offshore and acquire like such high resolution data sets. And because of that, as of now, less than 25% of Australian waters are actually covered with multi beam. And if we look in the northern areas, it actually goes down to less than 10 percent. So we've tried to think like how could we like help? Like how can we like build on already existing data sets to change that and to increase that coverage? And we've looked into crowdsource data sets, into satellite derived bathymetry, and also, which will be the topic of my talk today, seismic derived bathymetry. Uh, next, please. So around Australia has been like in excess of 350 surveys collected over the last 40 years, covering nearly like 625,000 square kilometers. And most of that data is public. And it's actually quite common to use seismic surveys to derive bathymetry. People are often doing it at a local scale for like offshore engineering projects, for example. But there hasn't been any like compilation so far. So we're like, OK, maybe we can do that. Maybe we can gather everything that exists to process and produce a national seismic derived bathymetry data assets. Um, next, please. And this is something we've been working on for the last few months. I'm not quite sure what the, why the boxes are all offset, but anyway. Um, and for this project, we split Australia into like three main areas of interest that we are processing one after another. And today I'm going to show you example from the Bros and Bonaparte basins that we've just completed. There are like 106 3D seismic surveys within the area covering 123,000 square kilometers. Next. So first, how do we do that? So we are using both the actual seismic data and the navigation recording. So the seismic data is essentially like a layer cake of horizons and reflectors, and we are picking the first reflections that is assumed to be the seabed. But because seismic data is acquired mostly for oil and gas exploration and production with the target of the reservoir, it is processed to, well, improve the image of the reservoir, which is located thousands of meters below the seabed. So quite often there are quite a few artifacts affecting the seabed reflections. So because of that, we are also including the navigation recording to calibrate as much as possible the seismic data. So once we've collected like the seismic data and extracted the first reflection in time, we convert everything from the time domain to the depth domain using site-specific velocity profiles. Once this is done, we grid the data and calibrate it. It is quite important to do this calibration because they are often vertical offsets between adjacent surveys. 
And to do these calibrations, we are using the depth soundings from the Australian Hydrographic Office. And once this is done, we have the final seismic derived bathymetry. So kind of Next. Uh, so this is how it looks like over yeah. the Bonaparte and Browse basins. Uh, so so there's someone talking somewhere? Ron? Oh, anyway. Uh, so we processed 72 3D seismic surveys, which cover an area of 91,000 square kilometers, uh, which is quite impressive because it only took us like maybe three months for two people to process that data. And if you were to require like such acreage with multibeam, it would literally take years. Uh, so we have like an average spatial resolution of 16 by 16 meters. And to assess the vertical resolution, we compared the seismic derived bathymetry versus the multi-beam data. And this is what you see on the lower right graph. So we have a coefficient of correlation of one, which is pretty unique, and a mean average error of 11.5 meters. So that's our vertical accuracy. It may seem like a lot, but you have to keep in mind that the average water depth is of roughly 12 to 1500 meters. So that's actually less than 1% of um, the water depths. And the other thing to consider is that if you look at the plot, you can see that there's often a constant offset between the seismic derived bathymetry and the multi beam bathymetry. And that's just a limitation of the calibration points we are using. So the actual relative vertical resolution is much higher than that. Uh, so to illustrate what I'm saying, I'm just going to show you three examples from the data sets and compare them with the regional compilation that was produced by Rob Beeman a few years ago. Uh, and you have to bear in mind that those examples only represent a fraction of the data sets. So on the left hand side, you can see the regional bathymetry and on the right hand side, the seismic derived bathymetry. So we can see essentially the same features. But with a seismic derived bathymetry, we have much more details. Like on the carbonate buildups, we can see the terraces, we can see the individual uh, pinnacles. We can also see the channels going around the buildups. We can even see some mass transport deposits on the flank of the southwestern buildups. So it's quite impressive. Like everything is much neater. Uh, next. Another example which I really like, which is a further down south, is, is this one. Because when we look at the regional bathymetry, well, we can see that there's something, but it's not quite clear exactly what. So we are on the shelf here. And there might be something, but it may just be artifacts. Whereas with the seismic derived bathymetry, we can see beautifully like all those summer, like submerged river systems. And we can actually follow all of those channels from the shoreline to the shelf break. And it's I really like the level of details we have with like all the small like uh, in cuts and the borders, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And next for my last example. So this one is to the southwest. And I find this one really interesting because on the regional bathymetry here, they had both uh, multi beam and low resolution data. And we can very nicely see like all the canyons, but there are obviously some gaps and like some significant areas which are not surveyed. And with the seismic derived bathymetry, we are actually able to bridge all of those gaps. And now we have a much nicer picture of all the canyon systems. And what is really interesting is that when we compare like the multi beam data from the compilation and the seismic derived bathymetry, we can see that the resolution is really as good. Like, even though the bin size is a bit lower with the seismic derived bathymetry, the overall results is very great, especially in deep waters because of the width of the beam with multi beam data. And next. Uh, so, just to conclude this presentation, the key points are that around, around Australia, there were like 350 seismic surveys acquired and roughly two thirds to three quarters are public, which means that we would be able to process about 400,000 square kilometers of bathymetry and everything would be made public. We are doing that to so anyone can access it, use it, play with it. So we've just completed the Browse and Bonaparte basins 
And next, we're going to move to the southeastern and southwestern margins, and we're going to finish with uh, the southern half of the North Wales Shelf. Once this work is completed, we are also going to produce guidelines so anyone can reproduce it, learn from our mistakes, uh, and also contribute uh, to the project and on other areas. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is that um, at the same time, we have like a couple of students, including myself, working on the interpretation of all those CBET features, and I hope to have more to say on that uh, shortly. So thanks for your time, and if you have any questions. <laughs> Thanks very much. And uh, so we have a couple of comments, just really impressive um, data set to be bringing into the light. I think it's amazing. Any questions for you, Liz, while he's online? Nope. Okay, so moving on. Uh, so it's back over to me since I'm already talking. Um, so we just wanted to give a quick overview of the work plan. So we, we are in the process of finalising our work plan for the coming financial year. It's in a fairly robust uh, draft state. We're literally meeting on it tomorrow and we have our quarterly planning on Monday. Um, however, we're still focusing up on our 2030 goals of making sure that our data and our key products for the Australian region are available, readily discoverable and easily used. Uh, we're trying to improve our seabed data coverage. So one of the things that we are doing is we have just received a compilation from ULIS of the seismic data and we'll be looking to publish that in the hopefully not too distant future. Uh, and continuing with our uh, series of engagements to make sure that seabed mapping in the Oz seabed uh, goals and, and hopes and dreams are widely understood and used across the community. So just maintaining that really valuable uh, group that you all are with respect to being a nice connected community. And that I think is the end of our main showcase. I'm going to hand back to Scott now just to um, wrap up and then maybe we, if there's any questions we can have some outstanding chats. Thanks, Nat, and um, hello to everyone who's come on since I opened the meeting an hour ago or so. Um, just a plug here for those who haven't discovered this on the Oz Seabed website as yet, and that's the survey coordination tool. Uh, and in particular, the new functionality we've developed through a collaborative project with the Marine and Coastal Hub through the NEST program in the last um, six to nine months. And that's this areas of interest um, submission space in on, in the tool. I encourage everyone, if you haven't already, we've, and thanks to those who have, we've, we've got an impressively growing list of areas of interest being, being entered into. But if you haven't done so yet, please jump in, have a look. It's all about expressing, uh, as the title suggests, areas that you're interested in seeing data collected, either by yourself or or someone else who has the capability to map and sample the seabed. Uh, and this will be used to inform the ongoing discussion within the community about areas that we might invest in, in collecting data down the track. So it's it's something that GA is going to maintain uh, through the Seabed portal into the future and use it to inform the discussion, as, as I said. So please spend a moment to look through. It does take a moment of time to, to work through because we're collecting a lot of information in there regarding the, the reasons, the criteria, the drivers for, for areas of interest. And that, that's an important uh, set of information to collect, of course. Uh, for those who are able to get to AMSA uh, up in Cairns in a couple of weeks, I'll be giving a, a paper on, on this work, as well as it'll be integrated into part of the OZ Seabed workshop on the Friday of that, that AMSA week. So I look forward to seeing folk in Cairns and sunny Cairns in a few weeks. But uh, if, if you're not going to, to AMSA, get in touch and we can help um, work you through it as well. So thanks, Nat. And we might just open it up for any questions or discussions or things that have um, you know, come into your mind in the last bit. Don't be shy. We're happy to hear from you all. We have hands up from Ralph. Uh, Nat, uh, my question is uh, uh, directed to Nigel and the HIP program. Um, he was talking about the fact that when they start releasing the hip data to our seabed, that it will be a 30 meter grid. 
Um, how was that um, value actually arrived at? That's what I was interested in. Uh, there was a um, uh, discussion uh, at um, a higher level about uh, what sort of detail we would allow to be released, which uh, uh, I can't really go into, but um, that, that's the, the value that they came up as. And, and it is to match the um, the resolution of the uh, models that uh, Rob Beeman and others are putting out where a 30 meter resolution seems to be a very common uh, a resolution for a seabed model. So we issuing the data for public release under Creative Commons at 30 meter resolution. Um, and the the data itself is available under license from the HO, so licensing at Hydro. Um, can uh, you can request access to uh, more detailed versions of the data? Um, we have the, the the raw, the level two data, and the uh, gridded data. Um, all our gridded data is at cube surface, so uh, the point cloud isn't isn't fully cleaned, as, as somewhat like because it's a statistical service that we're running for the navigation service. Um, but so yeah, it'll be a 30 meter grid uh, publicly on our seabed with no limitations, and you can request it from from the AHO directly with restrictions. Thanks, Nigel. Fantastic. Just looking. No other hands up. Nothing else in the chat. Some latecomers. I think. So thank you all for coming along. Um, it's, you know, the start of a new financial year. We've got a new government. It's going to be an exciting few years, I think, ahead for Aussie, but we're just going from strength to strength. So I think a quick game's a good game. We're all done. Excellent. So don't forget to grab a copy of the link that Neil Evans put in um, so that you can access uh, the information regarding data submission. We are ready to receive your data. If it's not multi-beam data, don't be discouraged. Get in touch with us and um, we can see how we go going forward. All right. Thanks all. We'll see you later. Thanks, Thanks Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.